I'm, I'm very excited uh, to talk about Cabinet of Curiosities. It was a wonderful anthology through and through. I loved each and every installment. Um, Great. I, haven't, I still haven't seen them yet. I'm so excited to see the rest of them. That's what I keep hearing <laughs> from everybody is I haven't seen mine or I haven't seen everybody else's and I'm excited for y'all get to, to get to see it as well. Um, and I love that Guillermo handpicked everybody for all of these stories. And I'm curious, how did Guillermo come into your life and, and, you know, reach out to you to want uh, to be a part of this one? Well, I'd met Guillermo um, back in my previous life as a DVD producer. I did blade two and um, you know, we grew up, I mean, he, he's, we're basically the same generation who grew up reading the same stuff and had the same kind of fascinations and obsessions. And um, so we instantly had a lot to talk about. He's extremely well read and um, better read than I am, actually, as much as I, I like to think of myself as having read all the, all the important, you know, uh, stuff he, he puts me to shame. But um, so we'd kind of, I, I, you know, he's one of those guys that I, I used the DVD opportunities to meet people that I was intrigued by. And I had seen the devil's backbone the night before I met him, a new line had offered me a list of other upcoming projects. And I was like, I just, I want to meet Guillermo. So, um, I was already, I've always been kind of, uh, a huge admirer of, of his particularly devil's backbone and pan's labyrinth. And, um, you know, and then I did a short a few years ago and he very kindly, uh, he said some really nice things about it and told me to use his name and, and try to, you know, build up a drum beat. So we'd been in touch occasionally over the years. I remember during production of my movie, I was looking for some uh, assistance and I, I tried to track him down at the DGA awards, but that happened to be the year that he won for the shape of water. So like I saw him, you know, he was being led across the room, like, on you know he had just won the award he was on the backs of a bunch of people and i waved at him and he waved back and that was we didn't get to talk but um but as i you know in the aftermath of uh the empty man's kind of you know sad release two years ago um when it was you know the victim of an agatha christie story right it was like which studio tried to kill the movie they both did <laughs> um and i was you know i, I was kind of in a it was a rough patch. It was like, I don't know what was going to happen with the thing. And, and I was looking for, uh, some, something to do and hoping something would come up and, and Guillermo just called out of the blue, um, you know, like the kind of the chubby finger of fate reaching down and tapping me on the shoulder and saying, I've got this great gift for you. So I was, uh, overjoyed to accept it. And, and that's pretty much how it came out. I mean, at some point he must've seen the empty man and, and, um, it, it, it was something kind of nice started to happen around the empty man. It's like it just, or this kind of organic grassroots kind of thing started. And so I, I heard that, you know, one of the other directors on the show had gone to Guillermo and miles and said that they should get me to do an episode and they had already contacted me. So that was really, really great. It's all, it was all really gratifying. And um, so when Guillermo calls, you say yes. And I said, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, that's, that's amazing. I mean, the horror, I love how tightly knit the horror genre community can be with one another. It's all about support uh, within the team, the group. And I love it. Um, Guillermo, Guillermo's essential nature is enthusiasm. I think, I mean, he's, he's just, he's very warm and loving and embracing and supportive. And that doesn't mean he's not discriminating and, and have his ways of doing things. And, and, you know, he certainly does, but he's, his fundamental nature is very nurturing. And um, yeah, I couldn't be more grateful. And that's certainly what you want uh, from producers. Uh, on Particularly like from a director who's become a producer, you know, which isn't, which can't be easy, right? Because you've got your way of doing things. And, and to be able to step back and not try to ter make somebody else's voice sound like your own voice is a really hard thing. And, he, you know, he's, he will get down on his knees and beg if you, do, you know, beg you to change something or do something a different way but he'll never force it on you and it's always up to you. And he'll, he'll bring all of his, you know, rather um, uh, enormous um, sphere of influence to bear on a question. But if you stand your ground and say, no, it's gotta be this way, he backs off. And that's not something a lot of other producers cut that have been directors can do. I don't think so. He's a real blessing that way. Well, I'm glad he was able to do that for you and everybody else involved uh, with this project. And uh, so with your short, were you familiar with uh, the source material prior to Guillermo presenting it to you? Or was this uh, your first time getting into it? 
No, I was. Um, he presented me three possible stories, two uh, Mr. James stories, uh, who I loved, and uh, and this one. And I remembered it um, vaguely when he told, mentioned the title. It rang a bell, certainly, but it had been, I think, since. I don't think I'd read it since the mid eighties, but I did have, it was in a collection called the dark descent and I have it on my shelf. So as soon as I hung up, I walked five feet across the room and pulled it off the shelf and reread it. And that one was the closest to getting ready to go. And so that's the one that I chose. The other one were the other ones were still kind of in various early, early stages of development. And I just wanted to, you know, there's always the possibility that one of them could get excluded if it wasn't ready in time and all of that. So I just kind of made the, made the, um, <laughs> rather mercenary choice to go with the one that was actually where they were already planning to build sets, you know? So, um, but yeah, I mean, I've been familiar with the story and its reputation. It's got a very, very, um, highly respected, uh, writer who, behind it. Stephen King, I think named it the best short story of the year that it came out, which was a long, you know, that's a, quite a pedigree. So it felt like a good, you know, a good pedigree to be jumping into, but I also kind of felt like I could get my hands around this. I kind of know what to do with it. So since you say that they were like on the verge of building sets, I mean, what is it like coming into a project uh, like that where you have a vision for it and then they, they've already almost started another vision for it? Well, Guillermo has this amazingly talented gaggle of, you know, carny folk and, and, uh, and draft dodgers up in Toronto who kind of just execute his visions on, uh, they worship him like some ancient, you know, uh, magnificent pagan God. And, and so when he was at some point, he knew that he was going to do this episode and he'd already had a lot of design stuff. They hadn't built anything yet, but they had done a lot of design work. That said, I was given carte blanche to work with Tamara Deverell, who is this really talented production designer who was doing the entire series. I don't know how she managed it um, to tweak it and fine tune it and change it to the needs, you know, that I, that I would, that I, the ones that I was able to anticipate about where I would need to put the camera and how the kinds of shots that I was looking to do the feeling of it though, the atmosphere of the set was beautifully done anyway. I mean, I was like, that's what I would have wanted it to be, even if I had been here from the beginning. So it was um, thankfully not a situation where we had to tear it down and start over, you know, that's yeah, <laughs> that would have been, uh, <laughs> that would have been a trickier situation <laughs> uh, to say the least. Um, yeah. So what were some of your biggest goals then in, in crafting the look and the aesthetic uh, for this episode? Well, I think <clears throat> in some ideal way, um, you're looking to make the atmosphere and the camera work, the world of the, of the, that the story takes place in be some kind of, reflection or refraction of the main character's psyche, right? And the circumstances that he's in. So, you know, obviously that, that brings up a lot of things about decay and about death. He's dying of cancer, right? So I wanted there to be a kind of, there was something that happened on the first day that we got Murray into the set. And it struck me as I was, as we were just doing the very first blocking with him and, and Glenn and when they, when he, when he's first looking into the room and I realized he's never going to leave this room. I mean, he already knows he's terminal. He knows that he doesn't have very long to live, but he certainly doesn't think he's going to die this night in this room. And as soon as he crosses that threshold, he's never leaving again. And that seems like something that maybe there's a, maybe he has some premonition about it. And so there's a pause at the threshold where he stops and it's almost like a little voice in the back of his head going, the next step is the last one, pal. And then he walks in and, and, you know, I didn't even have, I didn't have to explain it to Murray. I just said, take a pause here at this, at the door and stop and really think about it before you walk in. And he instantly, I'm assuming, I assume he just intuited what I was doing, but it was one of those lovely things when you're working with an actor like Murray, you don't really have to over explain. You just say, do this one thing. And he'll, and he does it and does it really beautifully. Same thing at the end with this gesture, when he raises his arms up in this kind of King Lear sort of thing, I just, it just came up while we were shooting. I was like, you know, do this thing with just raise your arms up and look up and plead to the sky. And that's all I had to say. And he just did it. <laughs> it's kind of, kind of beautiful, but you just want to create a world where things like that can naturally take place. Right. It's like, it has to feel like you're in an environment that allows for that. You can't be in the conference room of a Marriott and have a moment like that. It has to feel like the, you know, the internal states are being reflected in the externals. 
Well, and, and that certainly the the two then definitely married <clears throat> another well uh, within this episode, and I love that. Um, and I also love the design of the the alien itself. And I know that Guillermo is is very much uh, about practical, and it seems like everybody I've talked to across the board has talked about the practical effects that went into it. And so, what was it like for you working with the you know the the effects artists to really bring that creature to life for this episode? Guillermo's a really, uh, he's very focused on his monsters and his creatures, but he actually took a real backseat to this one. It was, um, I mean, I'm sure that he was watching the developments of it as he went along and, and when he had something to say, he would say it, but I think he, so I think he felt that it was going in a good direction, but, um, we had this really talented bunch of designers who did several different variations and I kept trying to push them toward uh, diseased genitalia was <laughs> kind of. I want this to all be about like really screwed up mashing together of of um, cocks and asses and pussies and just make it really sexual in a degraded, nasty kind of way. Um, I used a few uh, colorful <laughs> adjectives while we were putting it together, but um, but that and plus this kind of str- the 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 kind of recesses, the little holes and things that it has in it, just kind of strike a sort of phobic chord. And so as we as we went through it, it just that that silhouette of that creature when that was presented to me was seemed like that's the one. There were some other really good ones, but that felt like the one. And then we developed it from there and kind of fine tuned it and added added tentacles and some other things. And then when it was, so we shot it for real on the set, but we always knew that we were probably going to have to do the the tentacles digitally for one thing. And a lot of it ended up being replaced by a digital creation that was scanned and modeled on the actual physical one. And they look identical. Um, I mean, if you look at the dailies of the actual physical thing, you wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to tell, but, but the CG guys were able to add little bits of flexibility to it, make it kind of move in ways that the silicone couldn't quite move. So it was kind of a good marriage of, of the two disciplines where you use the CG to, to take the physical thing a little farther than you could. And um, that's, that's essentially how it happened. It certainly came across uh, very realistically. I mean, I, there were there were definitely shots where I couldn't tell if it was a real or, or a CGI thing. Good. So uh, good. Um, that's, the, that's the hope. Good. <laughs> um, uh, real quick, just to look away for, uh, from this for a moment. Um, as we were talking about earlier, I'm a big physical media proponent and uh, the empty man has been one that has been, that has grown on me uh, every time I rewatch it. And I'm curious, awesome. you know, uh, can we see a, a, a good like 4k physical release sometime in the future? Boy, your lips to God's ears, man. I would hope, so. I, I, I don't know how to make it happen. Um, the studio Disney just decided that uh, for whatever you know, their internal reasons were, they didn't want to do it. We had, obviously prepared for it there's um you know probably half an hour of deleted scenes there's a whole bunch of behind the scenes kind of things there's a uh, little you know teaser trailers and things that i cut while we were cutting the movie there, there was quite a bit set aside to put on there but they just didn't want it so i'm hoping that if the desire for it continues to build that somebody will come along and license it away from them or or they will decide that, that they want to do it themselves i mean i should probably not say what i really think um but it is it is a source of it's a thorn in my side that it doesn't exist and there's a beautiful 4k master of it that's ready and waiting and um for you know for having started out doing special edition dvds it's a, it's particularly tough stone to swallow that I, that it's not out but you know my fingers are crossed my fingers are crossed as well because i would love to add that to my collection uh thank I, you i would love i would love for you to be able to do that, that would be great. <laughs> <laughs> one day one day um and then coming back to uh cabinet of curiosities for my final question i love that guillermo's openings uh, introduce the directors specifically, as well as have those little statues. And everybody, all the directors I've talked to have said they they found that out by getting them in the mail. And I'm curious. So what was what was your reaction when you saw your little statue and you learned what Guillermo was doing with that? I had no. Yeah, it was the same thing. It just showed up in the mail. I had no idea what it was. We had gotten a little a couple of weeks before that. I think he sent out some uh, a jacket, like a, a crew jacket. And then this thing came and I 
literally had no idea what it was. I was, I almost, I was like, did Guillermo make this himself? What is, what, it was like a little totem, a kind of, um, and I thought it was Dr. Winters with the little ball next to him. And I didn't, hadn't, had no idea what it was until I saw the final episode and, and saw that it was actually used in his intros, which is wonderful. So it's, it's a great little gesture. It's the kind of thing that he would come up with. I love his intros. I think they're great. And I love his, uh, I love his accent. I love the prop that they built. The, the, the cabinet is gorgeous. It's, uh, it's a wonderful bit of filigree that kind of, I think, elevates the whole series. I couldn't agree more. And it, it just, it's a further testament to his, his devotion to promoting uh, other filmmakers. So I, I, I yeah. love it. And I can't wait for you to finally get to see the rest of the episodes as well as everybody else. Uh, <laughs> yeah, David, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me. I greatly my, appreciate it. My absolute pleasure, Grant. Anytime. Have a good rest of your week. All right. Take care. You too.